Hi everyone, I'm Michael Millerman and this is Millerman Talks. My goal today is to give you a comprehensive overview of Nietzsche's The Use and Abuse of History. If you like these video lectures, please hit like and subscribe to the channel. You can find my in-depth courses on other philosophers at millerman.teachable.com or visit michaelmillerman.ca for my essays, videos, and other ways that you can support the channel. Now let's go. What is the significance of historical studies for man, Nietzsche asks. Are historical studies important primarily for the way that they impel us to act? Or are they worthwhile in and of themselves, independently of what they motivate us to do? Is simply knowing the past as it was, as objectively as possible, a good thing? In this work, Nietzsche takes aim at the then popular view that to understand history and oneself as historical is an unqualified accomplishment. In his preface, he contrasts this newfound historicism, of which the modern age was so proud, with the outlook of the classics, whose nursling he says he is. Since his thoughts are drawn from classical influences, they are unseasonable or contrary to our time. In other words, in some sense, Nietzsche is taking a classical stance to oppose a modern prejudice, whereas what we're used to is taking a modern stance to oppose what we see as a classical prejudice. He's reversing that. Nietzsche will not say that we don't need history at all. Rather, he says we need it for life and action, not as a convenient way to avoid life and action. As we go through this presentation together, you'll see why he thought that history can be a way to avoid life and how history can be put in the service of life instead. Nietzsche begins by asking us to consider animals who live unhistorically, who can't forget, remember, or lie, who are always in the present, who don't bear upon themselves the burden of a past, and who can therefore seem to man to represent a sort of lost paradise or the happy blindness of a child. When, in contrast to animals, man discovers or learns to sense his historical nature, he's reminded of what his existence really is, an imperfect tense that never becomes perfect. And he knows that being is merely a continual has been, a thing that lives by denying and destroying and contradicting itself. Because existence is historical, human existence, and history disturbs the free play of the present, only he can be happy, according to Nietzsche, who can leave himself behind on the threshold of the moment and forget the past. You must be able to stand on a single point and not see yourself as swept along in the stream of becoming. Not only if you want to know what happiness is, but also if you want to act. So if you see yourself as only part of this never-ending flux of life, according to Nietzsche, you don't have the position or the perspective that would impel you to act. Nietzsche's point as he summarizes it here is that a historical sense, the sense that everything is constantly underway or becoming, injures and finally destroys the living thing, be it a man or a people or a system of culture, because it induces sleepiness and rumination, a kind of fatalism that sees itself and sees life itself as a vanity of vanities, a situation in which all things shall pass this too shall pass, and therefore a kind of quietism and not life and action. This is going to be a key takeaway from his book. The historical sense induces a kind of fatalistic sleepiness. So on one hand, we are and cannot but be historical. On the other hand, the historical sense stands opposed to action. What Nietzsche suggests concerning this bind is that we must see clearly how great is the plastic power of a man or a community or culture. I mean, he says, the power of specifically growing out of one's own self, of making the past and the strange one body with the near and the present, of healing wounds, replacing what is lost, repairing broken molds. That is, we must see clearly the extent to which we have control over how we interpret or treat our history, how we shape it with our plastic power. Man has, 
or rather, some men have, the power to circumscribe horizons for themselves and not to get lost in the stream of all things. As Nietzsche writes, we must know the right time to forget as well as to remember and instinctively to see when it is necessary to feel historically and when unhistorically. Both the historical and the unhistorical are equally necessary to the health of an individual, a community, and a system of culture. Let me read you a passage in which Nietzsche illustrates the importance of the unhistorical for man's action. Quoting now. By the way, I'm going to be quoting throughout, and I'm not always going to tell you when I'm quoting, Okay, but here I have a nice long passage. Imagine a man swayed and driven by a strong passion, whether for a woman or a theory. His world is quite altered. He is blind to everything behind him. New sounds are muffled and meaningless, though his perceptions were never so intimately felt in all their color, light, and music. And he seems to grasp them with his five senses together. All his judgments of value are changed for the worse. There's much he can no longer value as he can scarcely feel it. He wonders that he has so long been the sport of strange words and opinions. That his recollections have run round in one unwearying circle and yet are too weak and weary to make a single step away from it. His whole case is most indefensible. It is narrow, ungrateful to the past, blind to danger, deaf to warnings. A small living eddy in a dead sea of night and forgetfulness. And yet, this condition, unhistorical and anti-historical throughout, is the cradle not only of unjust action, but of every just and justifiable action in the world. No artist will paint his picture, no general win his victory, no nation gain its freedom without having striven and yearned for it under these very unhistorical conditions. Nietzsche mentions at this point the superhistorical men, by which he means people who do not see progress in history, but who regard the past and the present as one and the same, typically alike in their diversity and forming together a picture of eternally present and perishable types of unchangeable value and significance. So for these people, they're not historical. They don't think that there's a historical progress. They think every age is just going to somehow repeat the same tragic comedy of the previous age. They're above the changing of the times. But because as a rule, these super historical types see history as suffering, and because Nietzsche's goal by contrast is for us to be joyful in our unwisdom and have a pleasant life as active men who go forward and respect the course of the world, he sets aside these super historical men and turns instead to the issue of life versus wisdom, setting forth the distinction and making his case for using history for the sake of life. And that's the topic that we're going to turn to next. Now here Nietzsche discusses three ways that history is necessary to the living man. So first we saw history can be opposed to life. And here we see three ways that history is necessary to life. Okay, this is very important to get clear on. So three ways that history is necessary to the living man in relation to his action and struggle, his conservatism and reverence, and his suffering and desire for deliverance. These three ways are called the monumental, the antiquarian, and the critical. Monumental history provides examples, teachers, and comforters to the man of action and power who fights a great fight and needs examples. Monumental history is for the sake of action. Those who understand this must therefore hate to see idlers rushing through the picture galleries of the past for a new distraction or sensation. Those curious tourists and laborious beetle hunters climbing up the great pyramids of antiquity, as Nietzsche puts it, the man of action looks to monumental history not out of curiosity, but for the sake of action, happiness, and fame. He learns from historical exemplars how to be a great man. 
And he discovers, in doing so, the oneness and continuity of the great in every age as a kind of protest against the change and decay of generations. To learn from an example of past greatness, according to Nietzsche, it's necessary to neglect many of the differences and to force the individuality of the past into a general formula. If you're using past examples of greatness as your exemplar, you need to somehow abstract from some of the differences, paper them over, generalize them in order for them to serve as inspiration to you. Monumental history, therefore, cannot have complete truth. It doesn't aim for total, objective, factual accuracy. Rather, it brings together things that are incompatible and generalizes them into compatibility. It does not try to discover the real nexus of cause and effect, the real historical nexus of cause and effect. Rather, it aims, as Nietzsche puts it, to depict effects at the expense of causes. It shows great examples to motivate action, not to exhaustively describe the conditions that made greatness possible as a matter of historical fact. It brings history closer to fiction, to mythical romance, as he puts it. You get a sense here of that plastic power that Nietzsche talked about earlier. You have this creative approach to the great examples of the past. And you have to be creative with respect to them in order to have them serve as a basis for your great action here and now. When weak and inactive people take monumental history into their hands, Nietzsche writes, they use it as a cloak under which their hatred of present power and greatness masquerades as an extreme admiration of the past. So he has this discussion about what happens if monumental history falls into the hands of the weak or how do the weak people pervert this approach to history. Well, in fact, they use it against present greatness, not in the service of present greatness. Having discussed monumental history, Nietzsche next turns to antiquarian history, the second approach to history that can be useful for life. Antiquarian history is necessary to the man of conservative and reverent nature who looks back to the origins of his existence with love and trust. For such a person, all that is small and limited, moldy and obsolete, gains a worth and inviolability of its own from the conservative and reverent soul of the antiquary migrating into it and building a secret nest there. The history of his town, some of you may be able to relate to this, becomes the history of himself. He looks on the walls, the turreted gate, the town council, the fair, as an illustrated diary of his youth and sees himself in it all, his strength, industry, desire, reason, faults, and folly. The greatest value of this antiquarian spirit of reverence, Nietzsche writes, lies in the simple emotions of pleasure and content that it lends to the drab, rough, even painful circumstances of a nation's or individual's life. How could history serve life better, he asks, than by anchoring the less gifted races and nations, rather peoples, to the homes and customs of their ancestors and keeping them from ranging far ahead in the service of better to find only struggle and competition? Antiquarian history serves life by anchoring people and keeping them from ranging beyond what they're capable of, where they will find struggle and competition. That's how he puts it here. It serves this reverential attitude towards oneself and one's past. As in the case of monumental history, though, antiquarian history can falsify the past or distort it for its purposes. The antiquarian sense of a man, he writes, or of a city or a nation, has always a very limited field. Many things are not noticed at all. The others are seen in isolation as through a microscope. The things of the past are never viewed in their true perspective or receive their just value. But value and perspective change with the individual or the nation that is looking back on its past. And just as monumental history could be used against life, so too with antiquarian history, which degenerates from the moment that it no longer gives a soul and inspiration to the fresh life of the present. 
The antiquarian habit can degrade a considerable talent, a real spiritual need into a mere insatiable curiosity for everything old. Moreover, antiquarian history only understands how to preserve life, not how to create it. And thus it always undervalues the present growth and it hinders the mighty impulse to a new deed. In fact, it can paralyze the doer who in acting replaces historical and ancestral pieties with a new fact and a new piety and who therefore is in some sense at the opposite pole of the antiquarian or the old. You see, excessive reverence for the old means paralyzing the bringer of the new, paralyzing the doer, the actor, who replaces the ancestral with a new fact, a new piety. The third way of looking at the past, we had monumental, antiquarian, now we have critical. It also serves life. Critical history, or can be made to serve life, critical history is called upon to bring the past to the bar of judgment, interrogate it remorselessly, and finally condemn it. Every past, Nietzsche writes, is worth condemning. This is the rule in mortal affairs, which always contain a large measure of human power and human weakness. It is not justice that sits in judgment here, he writes, nor mercy that proclaims the verdict but only life, the dim driving force that insatiably desires itself. The process of putting a knife to the roots of the past is always dangerous, for as we are merely the result of previous generations, we're also the result of their errors, passions, and crimes. It's impossible to shake off this chain. We may condemn the errors of the past, but we cannot escape the fact that we spring from them. Yet critical history does put a knife to the roots and lays down a new beginning, a second nature that becomes like a first nature, as Nietzsche puts it. We've now discussed three ways that history can serve life according to Nietzsche. The end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. No, in fact, there's much more to cover. We're only about 20 pages into the book. Let's see what Nietzsche says next. What he says is that in our time, meaning in his time, but possibly also in ours, the clearness, naturalness, and purity of the connection between life and history have vanished. What has severed the connection between history and life is science, the demand for history to be a science. In his possession of excessive knowledge, man is like the snake that has swallowed a rabbit whole and lies still in the sun, avoiding all movement, not absolutely necessary. Our excessive knowledge immobilizes us. Instead of action, man has recourse to his inner life or inner world, which he regards as his true personality. Older, more active peoples, by contrast, they may have known less than we do, but in knowing more, we moderns have nothing of our own. We only become worth notice by filling ourselves to overflowing with foreign customs, arts, philosophies, religions, and sciences. We are, Nietzsche writes, wandering encyclopedias, as an ancient Greek who strayed into our time would probably call us. But the only value of an encyclopedia, he continues, lies in the inside, in its contents not in what's written on the outside. And so the whole of modern culture, as encyclopedic, is essentially internal. Now for Nietzsche, this internalization and its split from external matters, you know, this division between the internal substance and the outer form stands against the unity of artistic style in every outward expression of a people's life. It sunders a higher unity and destroys the people's healthy instincts. Those people who thought they were rejecting the conventionalism of form, who thought that outer formalities are merely conventional, therefore unimportant compared to the inner substance, those people who thought that they were rejecting the conventionalism of form and turning to their natural personality are for Nietzsche unknowingly merely imitating the worst conventions of others. Go through any German town, he writes, 
you will see conventions that are nothing but the negative aspect of the national characteristics of foreign states. Everything is colorless, worn out, shoddy, and ill-copied. If there happens to exist a great productive spirit among a nation that's not sure of its inward unity, such a one, this great productive spirit, will take a profound insight into fate in exchange for the godlike desire of creation and help, ending his days as a lonely philosopher with the wisdom of disillusion. Now, that troubles Nietzsche. He doesn't want this philosopher who could demonstrate and embody a godlike desire of creation to become merely a lonely, disillusioned person who's seen into the fate of modern man. He wants more. So Nietzsche would rather have great productive spirits work to overcome the division between inner and outer. My testimony shall stand, he declares in one of the centrally important passages in the book, that it is German unity in its higher sense, which is the goal of our endeavor, far more than political union. It is the unity of the German spirit and life after the annihilation of the antagonism between form and substance, inward life and convention. The goal of Nietzsche's reflections, the goal of his appeal and of his rhetoric, of his analysis, of what he's up to here is to unify the inner and the outer, the substance and the form, life and spirit. So a quick recapitulation of where we are so far, history can be useful to life, but it's been separated from life and as a science put against life. This lifeless science has forced apart form and substance in the modern German who retreats into the inwardness of his knowledge and no longer has the unity of substance and form. And Nietzsche wants to restore the broken unity between life and spirit. That's where we've come. So now let's continue. Nietzsche then considers in more detail the ways that an excess of history can be an enemy to the life of a time. In banishing instinct, history has turned men into shades and abstractions. As a result, no one dares fulfill the law of philosophy in himself. No one lives philosophically, not even those, he says, who think, write, print, speak, and teach philosophically. For even they can do so, not as human beings, but as machines. So the mere fact that you talk about philosophy, write about it, speak about it, think about it, doesn't mean that you're living philosophically. If all of those other activities have been separated from the vital impulse of a well-lived life, even a machine could do it. I'm sure there are many artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning promulgators of philosopha memes or something like that. It's a total nightmare, according to Nietzsche. Philosophy here is a way that we live, not just something that we do mechanically. Well, indeed, you know, when you have this contrast of man and machine, there are no real men anymore for Nietzsche in modernity, but only historical pictures of the march of civilization. And Nietzsche then summarizes his thesis as follows. Only strong personalities can endure history. The weak are extinguished by it. The worth of history, therefore, whether monumental, antiquarian, or critical, depends on the strength of the personality who employs it. So it's not an unqualified good. It's good in the hands of the strong and creative ones, and it's destructive of life in the hands of the mediocre. As for the eunuchs, or machine men, or rather sexless neuters who turn to history, Nietzsche's characterizations here, it is indifferent what they study if history itself always remains beautifully objective to them, as those, in fact, who could never make history themselves. So in wanting to just understand history objectively, they don't make a distinction between what's high and low, what's important and trivial, what gives fire to life and what snuffs life out. These, you can't even call them men. You can't even call them women. You can only call them neuters. They are 
dead to life for Nietzsche. And he regards his contemporary cultural critics and historians as precisely such weaklings, since their supposed objectivity only reflects the emptiness of their personalities. Nietzsche next turns his attention to the relationship between the supposed objectivity of the moderns, on one hand, and to the virtue of justice, on the other. You can already anticipate that he finds that the moderns do not have the right to claim to be just. Remember, he's taking the side of a classical alternative as he sees it, where you don't have this break between the spirit and life, and he's criticizing the moderns. So when he tells you he's going to say something about the modern claim to justice, you can already tell he's going to say they don't have a right to make that claim for themselves. But let's see exactly what he says about it. No one has a higher claim to our reverence than the man with the feeling and the strength for justice, Nietzsche writes. The man of justice is the most reverend example of the human race, for truth is his aim not in the form of cold, ineffectual knowledge, but the truth of a judge who punishes according to law. The search for truth, Nietzsche continues, is often thoughtlessly praised, but it has something great in it only if the seeker has the sincere, unconditional will for justice, which few men have. Truth without will is ineffectual, and will without truth, or the impulse to justice without the power of judgment, has been the cause, he writes, of the greatest suffering to men. You need both will and truth, the impulse to justice, and the power of judgment. But not everyone has the power of judgment, especially the power of judging the past. Only by straining the noblest qualities you have to their highest power will you find out what is greatest in the past, Nietzsche writes. Therefore, only a rare spirit can write a history. The objective weaklings who understand nothing great can't do it. Another issue with supposedly objective history deprived of strength of spirit is that it destroys illusions and robs existing things of the atmosphere in which they can live. Nietzsche argues that a thing can live only through a pious illusion so that whatever destroys that illusion also destroys life. Art has the opposite effect to history, however, which is why art can serve life. And history transformed into art may be able to preserve instincts or arouse them. This is another key point in understanding Nietzsche, the opposition of science and art, and the life-giving effects of pious illusions, which science aims to destroy, knowing not what it does thereby, and which art or history turned into art can protect, foster, and inflame something along those lines. We're making good progress through the text. A little bit more to go. You're going to like what's next. Nietzsche makes a point now about the religious character of belief in historical progress that I'd like to summarize for you briefly. First, he says that the historical sense of the modern scientist is akin to the religious sense of the medieval theologians, since each of them believes that he's on the cusp of the completion of history, or that he stands on the crest of a historical wave. The consequence, though, is that the modern man feels himself to be old, to be there at the end, at the decay. And that's a feeling or belief that's inconsistent with Nietzsche's call for us to serve life and action. If you think you're at the end, late to the game, there's nothing in that vital, spontaneous, and alive. Here's a good phrase from this section that encapsulates his view. What is there in a couple of thousand years, he asks, the period of 34 consecutive human lives of 60 years each, to make us speak of youth at the beginning and the old age of mankind at the end of them? Does not this paralyzing belief in a fast-fading humanity cover the misunderstanding of a theological idea inherited from the Middle Ages that the end of the world is approaching and we are waiting anxiously for the judgment? Moreover, he says that this particularly Hegelian, in its modern philosophical form, this particularly Hegelian view of history as a process that culminates in self-consciousness 
is harmful and degrading, leading to total acquiescence in whatever is actual, since for Hegel, what's actual reflects the rational unfolding of spirit. So if you think that history is progressive, that the progress is rational, that there's this inner historical necessity, then you get to a position where you're just assenting to whatever is the case. And that's what Nietzsche next characterizes here, this submission to history as a force that unfolds through rational necessity. Quote, the man who has once learned to crook the knee and bow the head before the power of history nods yes at last like a Chinese doll to every power, whether it be a government or a public opinion or a numerical majority. And his limbs move correctly as the power pulls the string. In short, the religious belief in the rational necessity of history produces new men with new virtues, the virtues of yes men, of neuter machines. The real man of virtue, by contrast, ever swims against the waves of history and submits himself to laws that are not the fickle laws of history. So for Nietzsche, the real man of virtue always swims against the waves of history. If today we are less likely than Nietzsche's contemporaries were to defer to historical necessity, and I'll leave it to you to decide to what extent that's the case, that may be in part due to the effect of Nietzsche's teaching itself. You can certainly see his influence on generations who defend youth, spontaneity, initiative, and life against senescence and resignation. If I were to read to you every great passage from this book, I'd be reading you the whole book. But let me isolate one more incisive remark that Nietzsche makes at the beginning of the next section when he's addressing the view common to the modern historical man that the history of man is part of a universal world history that includes the history of the non-human or sub-human world as well. This is just what we would consider evolutionary history and our place in it, where we understand ourselves on the basis of our animal ancestors, past and present to a certain extent. So here's what he writes in characterizing that perspective. The historical imagination has never flown so far, even in a dream. For now, the history of man is merely the continuation of that of animals and plants. The universal historian finds traces of himself even in the utter depths of the sea, in the living slime. He stands astounded in quivers before the mightier wonder the modern man who can see all this way. In other words, historical man is amazed by himself, by the man who can find continuity between himself and sea slime. In other words, he's amazed by the modern evolutionary scientist. Continuing the quote, he stands proudly on the pyramid of the world process. And while he lays the final stone of his knowledge, he seems to cry aloud to listening nature. We are at the top. We are the completion of nature. O oh, thou too proud European of the 19th century, art thou not mad? Thy knowledge does not complete nature, Nietzsche writes. It only kills thine own nature. Measure the height of what thou knows by the depths of thy power to do. Measured against that height, the proud European has nothing to be proud of, according to Nietzsche. After diagnosing the problem of how history can sap the strength from life, Nietzsche calls for us to live with vitality by setting free the healthy instincts of our youth. No God and no man will give a new generation life, he says. Only their youth will do it. Only the young Set this free, the young, the youth, and you will set free life as well. Youth knows how to be above time or against time, unhistorical or super historical. It does not lose itself in the infinite boundless sea of the knowledge of becoming. The mission of the youth is to shake to their foundations the present conceptions of health and culture with well-directed hatred and scorn. Nietzsche turns to tell this youth the way and the course of their salvation 
their rescue from the disease of history and their own history as well in a parable whereby they may again become healthy enough to study history anew under the guidance of life, making use of the past in that threefold way, monumental, antiquarian, or critical. Okay, so his hope is with the youth, teaching them to hate and scorn the current conceptions of health and culture, and by rejecting the objective history of the modern scientific historian to prepare them for the possibility of returning to a creative plastic power reappropriation of the three kinds of history that we've discussed. Nietzsche ends by writing that we must organize the chaos in ourselves by thinking back to our true needs or vital needs. And there is no more vital need for us than to restore against lifeless modern culture the idea of culture as a new and finer nature without the distinction between inner and outer, without convention or disguise, as a unity of thought and will, life and appearance. You remember that discussion from earlier, taking this broken apart into the inner substance and the outer form where the outer form has been devalued in all of culture's internal, putting that back together again life and spirit in a higher unity. That brings us to the end of the work. The key things to remember are these, that Nietzsche believes there's a tension between historical science and life, that he distinguishes between the monumental, antiquarian, and critical approaches to history as three ways history can serve life, if it's in the hands of the strong, rare ones, and that ultimately he aims through his project which is directed at the youth, or at those who influence the youth, to overcome the modern divided self in the service of the higher unity of spirit and life. I'm Michael Millerman. This has been a Millerman Talks on Nietzsche's The Use and Abuse of History. If you enjoyed this presentation, hit like, subscribe to the channel, and visit michaelmillerman.ca for ways that you can support this channel, including my courses, my book, some music, and a donate button. All the best. See you in the next video.